In this problem, we have a spherical charge here, solid spherical charge that has a total charge density of uh, Q, and the sphere has a radius of R. And our goal is to find the electric potential at some point within that sphere. So let's go ahead and make that explicit right here and write it out. So our goal here is to find some um, uh, electric potential at some point. And what we're gonna use, and since, since we don't have a, uh, an infinitely large uh, electric charge here is that we can use this form to find the electric potential at, at any certain point. So our goal now is to find out what all these different little uh, um, values are. So to begin with, we do have for our row right here, we can just say that uh, we weren't explicitly given uh, row, the volumetric uh, electric charge density, but we can divide that total charge that we were given in the problem by the uh, volume of the spherical charge, so 4 thirds power cubed. You can make that substitution there. And since uh, we have a sphere that we're working with over here, we can just use a uh, volumetric um, uh, volumetric element right here to uh, differentiate over. Nothing, nothing too different out of the ordinary here. So this is just your normal volumetric charge uh, element right here. And then lastly, when we're looking at the, uh, the R vector, that's the uh, separation vector from, from the point, from some sort of a chunk that is contributing to the electric potential to the point that we'll, at which we're evaluating the electric potential at. And so what we can use is if we, uh, we kind of just imagine that we just split this um, electric charge here into, um, uh, onto a uh, uh, coordinate system, now, if we just take this coordinate system here, and we bring it down. Oh, let me grab it this way. If we take that coordinate system and we just uh, correctly bring it down. One more try here before we... One more try. We bring it down. There we go. And we bring it down, right? And then imagine that this is uh, what we have, X, Y, and Z right here. Or... Uh, no, that's not right. I'm sorry. X. This is Z. This is Y. I always get that mess mixed up sometimes, but that's okay. X, Y, and Z. And so we'll just use uh, orange here. So if we have some sort of chunk right here, that we are evaluating the electric field, uh, or that's contributing to the electric field, and we're trying to evaluate the electric field here, right? So this is the vector right here from here to there. That's our curly R vector. So we just take some sort of chunk, it's going to contribute to the electric potential, and we take another chunk and uh, it contributes to the electric potential, and we just got to integrate all these up until we find the electric potential at this point, right? We can, we can adjust our coordinate axis so this point lies on the, and any point on the Y field here. So, on the Y axis there. So what we can say is that this distance, so the distance or the, the vector that from the origin to that contributing a chunk of the electric field has an angle of theta right here and we can just call that that vector r little r right now right so if we want to find out curly r which was the whole point of uh, all this that we're doing the whole point of finding curly r is finding it in uh, terms of things that either one that we're uh, that we already know like q or big r right here or two things that we're integrating over so we are we are integrating over r uh, and then we can try to figure out, change this in terms of that so that we can end up replacing it with things that we know. So, so we have curly R right here. And uh, the way we can describe it is we can use the law of cosines, right? So if we, if we kind of know what R or Y is right here, and if we know what um, uh, uh, little r is right here because we're integrating over it and we're also integrating over theta, then we can figure out what, uh, we can write curly R, the separation vector, in terms of things that we do know or will know once we finish our integration. So we can say that's R squared using the law of cosines plus uh, Y squared minus 2RY cosine theta. So we just use the uh, law, law of cosines to rewrite curly R in terms of everything that we are either integrating over or that we already know right there.
So now we'll go ahead and uh, make the, all those substitutions to this integral. This will end up turning into a triple integral. And we're just going to be evaluating it over all the, um, over all space that we have. So uh, zero to, before we even actually go into that. Just write these, uh, give them some space here. We uh, make our substitution and just keep it all under one denominator. So and then one over, and then we have our, the law of cosines that we wrote out. This all lives under square root, and then we have our volumetric charge element, which I'll just write on top here. R squared sine theta dr d5, no, d theta first, d5. And then so having the corresponding elements to our volumetric elements would be where we're going to go from 0, but for r, we're going to go from 0 to r. For theta, we'll go from 0 to pi, and for phi, we'll go from 0 to 2 pi. All right. Um, so theta is a pretty easy one. We're just going to be sweeping over the entire uh, axis for theta. So we can go ahead and take care of that one. And then let's see here. We'll rewrite it in terms of uh, that 2 pi on the outside here. So this is evaluating that phi integral, but we'll also move out all the rest of the uh, uh, constants just to clean up the integral so we have a better idea of what we're looking at on the uh, on the integrals And then there's a sine theta sitting on top. R squared dr d theta. Okay, let's go ahead and do some cleaning up here. So this, these go away here. Uh, let's see here. I think that's all the cleaning up that we can do right now. And then... So at this point, we can figure... We, we could either do the... Uh, the theta integral or the r integral uh, right now I can go ahead and tell you that typically what you want to do is do the, the easier one first that's not always the case but that's what I'll do now and in, in fact the easier one right now is the theta integral so we're gonna go ahead and tack this theta integral first and because uh, um, the uh, I, I <laughs> when I tried this one out beforehand the the R integral in the, in the current form is, is pretty nasty. The way it spits out, so it only makes the um, theta, the R integral is nasty, so, or the result of the th R integral is nasty, so whenever um, you finish that one, it actually makes the, the theta integral even harder, which we don't want to have happen. So we'll go ahead and do the theta integral, and um, I just went ahead and used an integral table, and I will from alpha, in order to solve this one, so it's not too crazy, thankfully. All sitting under a square root. So this is evaluating the theta integral from zero to, um, oops. Uh, oh no, sorry, that was right. Theta two, or pi to zero, r squared dr. At this point, we can clean up. R goes away. And then, let's see here. Nothing really happens to the constants on the outside. Here, and then, um, so we'll go ahead and input our limits of integration here. This ends up being a pretty big chunk. So we'll have on the denominator r squared plus y squared uh, plus 2, or actually this is minus 2r negative 1 for uh, cosine of pi. 
live equal to your square root. And then uh, r on the, or y on the bottom minus the same thing, r. But this is a positive y, or positive 1 for cosine is 0, all on top of a y. And then we have an r dr right here. OK. So next thing is uh, we'll clean it up. But one thing to we'll just get it all under one uh, denominator at this point. Drop our constants down. Nothing really changed on this side. And then uh, let's see r squared plus y squared plus 2ry. This might. Um, I just wrote might give you a hint on the road that we're probably going to be going down to solve this. Okay, that was a weird square root. Sitting on top of a y, r, dr. So actually, let me give you some space, bring it down because we'll have some notes right here. So at this point, this one's pretty easy, right? Uh, everything sitting under this square root is going to be, um, so this will be a, underneath is r plus y squared, under the square root, of course. But this one's um, this one's a little bit different right here. Anytime you have a minus sign sitting under a square root, you want to be careful. And uh, careful just in terms of math, but in terms of physics, um, uh, you want to be especially careful because you could have, uh, depending on what the value, which ones are greater, if, if r is greater than y, you could have, uh, it's no big deal, but if y is greater than r, then then you're going to have uh, an imaginary, and we're going to have to take that into consideration once we execute this square root. So if we have r minus y squared right here, it could split into two different things. Let me just put this under the square root here. So if uh, r is greater than y, then the whole thing, that square root is going to be equal to r minus y, but if r is less than y, then uh, will, then it's going to, we're going to want to take the positive square root, right? Because we're dealing with a physical object here, not anything imaginary right now, so. And we're going to be integrating over from 0 to r, so that encompasses both of these limits, so we're going to have to split this integral into two, tif two different parts to encompass both of these positive, um, positive, uh, uh, um, root values right here so this is where the the fork in the road happens but we can combine them with uh, just by summing the results of both of them so again uh, moral of the story is if you see a negative sign under a square root just be very careful and make sure you uh, encompass uh, um, the pot both of the positive square roots so this is what i mean by this so from from zero to y right uh, we're gonna have to take the uh, um the positive square root actually let me uh we have to take the positive square root so this part up here when i take that one it's going to be end up being um r plus y minus quantity of y minus r because at this point y is greater than r think about it because if this is our y if we go back up to um if this is our y point right and then if r is is this this tiny little piece right here and then we're going to need then y is greater than r right but we're slowly integrating over all um all r and at some cusp r is going to be greater than y and then that's when we need to split up this integral into the two different parts right here and so that's what i'm doing right now i'm doing it when um y is greater than r so we got a small r and we're going to integrate up all the way up to that cusp when uh, r becomes greater than y. So this is, this is going to be r dr under this square root. So it's y. And then we have to add. And this is when r becomes greater than y. Uh, we pick up where it left off. So y all the way up to big R right here. So quantity of r plus y minus r minus y right here, uh, r dr, all on top of a y, that was kind of sloppy, 
that's okay. Now we're in the home stretch right now. When we look at this one, this ends up being uh, 2R. And then over here, this one ends up being a uh, 2Y, which would end up canceling this Y at the bottom. So these kind of all collapse down and end up being uh, pretty easy integrals to evaluate. So zero to y of two r squared uh, over y dr. And then uh, we have an uh, integral of, I'll just pull the two out of this one from the y to r of uh, r dr right here. So pretty easy. They both have a two in common. So one thing that we can do is turn this into a four down here while we're uh, moving forward three fourths pi r cubed, epsilon naught. And let's evaluate these integrals. So once we evaluate that first one, it ends up being, let's see, one over y. Um, oops. y to the third over three, because the lower limit is uh, zero. So we can just, it ends up being one term, but the next one ends up being, uh, we have to subtract them both y squared, because it goes from y to r. And then uh, we're pretty much in the home stretch at this point. Right now it's just kind of rearranging and massaging the terms until they become something um, a little bit nicer. So we can play around uh, with the, oops, we can play around with the different, uh, uh, algebra here we'll split it up into because I, I want to try to condense these uh, y terms into one single terms right here so what I can do is just multiply this by 2 over here and then 3 right here get them under a common denominator and then maybe that'll be a good place to st stop Because optimally, you just, yeah, you want to clump them all under a single denominator. Let's make sure that the minus sign is back there. So it's, uh, let's see here, y to the sixth, y squared to the sixth. Uh, yeah, I think it, since I'm at the bottom of the page, I think this is a good place to stop. But again, you could you could keep massaging this into different forms, right? But um, uh, as, I, as I worked through this before, this, it, again, it's not, you can't really get into a form that's really uh, physically illuminating. I think in the problem, it says to verify this against problem two. 21 or something one of the other problems but um uh, you can eventually massage it into that form and and uh, get you in the way you want you want but I, I think this is a good place to stop right now and, and again the i think the crux of this problem right here was was recognizing that there was a minus sign and this square root and you need to just physically capture those two different positive square roots and then split them up into two different limits because you're gonna have to in, uh, there's there's something that's sp special that happens when y becomes um less than R over here. So yeah, that's the problem.